Herman Ponser, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so let's let's jump right in. I have this bad habit of assuming that everyone who's listening has already read the book, and I just want to discuss like the the finer details. But we should probably sure. start with a little bit um, of an overview. I kept I kept making notes like this is the sentence that defines the book, and I had like thirty of them. <laughs> so I'm curious, like, what do you think? Like, if you had to say what the what the book says, what your work has hmm. said, you know, in thirty seconds, what 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 would they the high point point for you? Sure. I think uh, the overall arching idea is this is how metabolism actually works. This is how your body actually burns calories and all the ways that that happens. And, um, and then the sort of the, the next layer is this is how the energy that we bring in and our diet affects our bodies. And this is how the energy that we burn off with exercise affects our bodies and understanding how those two pieces, those two big pieces in our daily lives uh, interact, uh, I think is, is what we spend a lot of the time in the book on. And the whole, you know, the idea here is that we're taking an evolutionary approach to this. We're not starting off with some diet that we want to sell and then figuring out how to make everything tell that story. We're starting off with the evolutionary biology of how the human species got to be the way it is and using that as our lens to understand these sort of big concepts in biology and in life and in our, you know, in, in diet and exercise. Yeah. So after reading the book, I have to say, like, I started looking at everything in my world in terms of energy balance. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, you know, like, um, I love to say life is a game of turning energy into babies. You know, that's from an evolutionary point of view. That's what it's all about. Um, and if you're in a positive energy balance, you're bringing more calories in, you can do that. So your body likes to be in that state. You know, if you're in energy, uh, negative energy balance, you're losing energy, you're losing weight. Your body hates that because, you know, it's 500 million years of animal evolution that doesn't doesn't want to be in that energy loss state. Um, and so, yeah, it really does come down to that. I mean, that, that's why I got into this was um, I, I, I'm not a dietitian or a clinician. I, I got into this uh, questions about energy expenditure in humans and other species because I want to understand how, you know, how life today got to be the way it is, especially for our species. Um, and energy is just such a key component of that. It's this sort of through line that that unites everything. Um, that that you know that that's my research agenda. That's my research program is understanding how the body works from that kind of perspective because I just think it's fascinating. How did you get into that when you were like studying as a, in high school or as an undergrad? Like, what yeah. led you to be so interested in this? I had no idea on earth what I wanted to do in high school um, with my life, and then um, I got to college and I took a, a course, um, a, a seminar in human evolution. It was a small class and it was these two professors. One was a, a biological anthropologist, which means that he was interested in how evolution shaped our bodies. Uh, another one, the other one guy was a cultural anthropologist interested in how, you know, the culture that we live in shapes the way that we behave in ways that you don't even know. Uh, and they kind of, it was great because it was a conversation between them throughout the semester about sort of culture and biology and how they interact and interplay. And it was for our, and for the students, it was eye-opening on every level, on the biology level, on the cultural level. Um, and I was really fascinated by the biological part, the way that sort of our, our evolutionary past shapes our lives today. Um, and I just thought, man, if I, you know, I, I grew up in a part of Pennsylvania that's an old coal mining town that is now a factory town. So they make pressed metal parts where I grew up in St. Mary's, Pennsylvania. I grew up in Kersey, but anyway, uh, and the, the little, they make little widgets that fit like in the anti-lock brake systems in your car and that kind of thing, right? So everybody I grew up with, their dads worked in the factories. Um, my parents were high school teachers, but everybody else, you know, seemed they were, dads were working in the factories, moms working, who knows what odd jobs are in stores or whatever, sometimes in the factories too. Nobody had academic jobs, you know, nobody had a, nobody was a professor that I knew. Um, but yeah, when I got to college and had that course, and then I thought, you, are you telling me I can do this for a living? This, you can make a career out of this? I was just, my mind was blown. So then ever since then, um, I just knew that if I could make it work, I was going to do this. Ask these questions, do this kind of work, and, and I couldn't feel luckier about being able to really do it. That's awesome. It's so interesting that you, you know, your background is in a coal mining. <laughs> what better, like... You know, like the the last chapter of the book kind of makes yeah. the point that 
energy is energy, whether we call it calories or miles per gallon or kilowatt hours. Yeah. And yeah. that, you know, that all that coal was essentially going to helping people sp make spend fewer calories with their physical bodies somewhere in the world. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy, right? We think about this energy economy um, totally separately from our internal energy. But that's that is, you know, that that separation is fiction you know it's total fiction because we're using and it, what's fun about that and that was that was a really fun chapter to end on for me with that book and explore that because i spent the first eight chapters of the book talking about all the internal energy we use and diet and exercise and all the physiology and then to say guys but you know we have to also be aware that there's a parallel track of energy expenditure that actually isn't separate from us um you know ever since humans have been using fire We've been using this external energy source to kind of to, to do the work that our bodies otherwise would do. So to digest our food, that's why, you know, nobody can live on a raw food. You, you can live on a raw food diet, but people generally don't do well on raw food diets and a raw food, all you know, wild food diet, I don't think is even tenable. Uh, there's no um, no credible evidence of, of like, you know, hunter gatherer groups that don't cook their food, for example. So we've been our bodies actually need a fire to do this external work of digestion so that our bodies can get enough energy out of the food that we eat. So we, you, when you realize that, and, and you know, fire's a million and some years old, you're like, oh my God, we're actually tied to this external energy economy, to the coal mines, you know? It isn't something that we can just decide to do or not do. We actually have to do that, uh, have that external energy expenditure. But how do we do that in a way that doesn't kill us? That's the question. Right, and what, what got to me when I was putting this together uh, from the book, is like the energy expenditures can, we don't have to see them. So like, I do know people who are surviving and doing quite well on raw foods diets and even kind of chubby, but they're eating lots of nuts. And so I have a pecan tree in my backyard. And for me to eat, to get process the pecans, to get like hundred calories of pecans, takes at least 50 calories and a couple of hours. Like yeah. if you're buying bags from Costco, you're not cooking it yourself, but you're still getting the benefits of somebody's fire. Yeah, that's a really good point. Plus, you know, uh, your friends, I imagine, yeah, you know, people who do well on raw food diets, they go to supermarkets full of, of foods that never existed in nature, right? Because we've changed them through farming. Not, not, I'm not even talking about like GMOs or anything like that. Just the act of farming for 10,000 years, 12,000 years, and, and selecting the varieties every generation. The farmer is doing this. Of course, this is how you, this is what you do when you farm. Pick the versions that pick the fruits that are the the you know have the most meat, have the most flesh, have the most energy, and now you know corn today doesn't look anything like corn looked ten thousand years ago, for example. So um, strawberries are completely different. You know, all the, it's so yeah yeah it's, it's fun. Or for that matter, the oils right? You have to press all the oils to get uh, all those olives or whatever to get the oils out of that. All that's energy, right? Right, and you point out in the, in the last chapter, which is kind of scary. That, you know, one of the one of the pieces of evidence for a completely unsustainable agricultural system is that we spend eight calories to get one. Yeah, isn't that terrifying? You know, no other no species could live like that forever, right? If you went to the into the woods and found that you know the squirrels or the deer or whatever had to burn eight calories of energy just to get one calorie of grass or one it, you you could know right away that's that's not going to work. Um, but we, our entire world economy is based on that, which is kind of scary. Yeah, like we're all Bernie Madoff, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And when the when the check comes due is when we're going to run out of fossil fuels, uh, which is like in a hundred or maybe one hundred fifty years. Like even even if you didn't care about climate change, right? This is I, this was scary for me writing the book. Even if you couldn't convince yourself to care about climate change or didn't even want to believe it was real. The reason that you need to get rid of fossil fuels in our energy portfolio is that we're going to run out of them, even by the most optimistic estimates in 100, 150 years. That's nothing. That's nothing. That sounds like a long time to us because we're going to be dead by then. But um, in the history of a species, that's a blink of an eye, you know. Um, and so and there's no guarantee that we're going to figure out what's what to do instead of it. So uh, if we don't start now and, and work on it. But uh, let's 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 talk at the at the micro level. Oh, sure. Which is where um, your your work is getting a lot of attention. And after I read the book, I tried to explain the concepts, and yeah. I'm a pretty good explainer. And I tried to explain it to my, my fitness buddies, and there was tremendous resistance. 
They're like, yeah. yeah, but no. So like, the, like the, you know, the, the punchline for them is when we exercise, we don't burn more calories than when we don't exercise, essentially. <laughs> Yeah, that's so, yeah, so that's that's kind of the interesting, weird, crazy result. Um, and so let's talk about how we, we get there. So we get to that really counterintuitive result by, um, by work with people who are really physically active. Uh, for me, this was work with the Hadza hunter-gatherer community in northern Tanzania. So these are traditional hunter-gatherers. They hunt wild game and, and, and gather wild plant foods. And they're getting as much physical activity in a day as a typical American gets in a week. And they have the same energy expenditures. We've measured this and we didn't expect this at all. We've measured this using doubly labeled water, which is this really accurate technique. Um, they have the same daily energy expenditures, same calories per day as Americans and Europeans and people in other industrialized you know, populations. And so you can be five to 10 times more physically active and your average energy expenditure per day is no different than if you're if you're the sedentary person. Now that doesn't mean that day to day your energy expenditure doesn't fluctuate up and down. Of course it does. If you run a marathon tomorrow, it's, you're going to burn more energy than if you didn't, you know, than today when you didn't run the marathon. Um, so it's going to fluctuate, but your body is basically adjusting the background level of expenditure to keep those fluctuations hovering around the same the same level, whether you're really active and so you know you're getting lots of exercise every day, or if you're less active and you get in your, and you're not, the, the average expenditure over the sort of week long time frames is going to be the same, um, or very close, you know, it's, it's not, you're not going to see that, uh, that activity effect clearly at all. Mm -hmm. And this has been replicated, right? The... Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we, we, we saw this with the Hadza community. We've seen this with other traditional communities that have really active lifestyles and have the same expenditures as everybody else. Um, we can see this in the lab. So if we take um, mice or you know, other lab animals and we make them work harder for their food, so we, we have a, a week when they don't have a, a wheel to run on, and then we, you know, the, we give the mice a wheel to run on and we watch them get more and more active over the course of a month. By the end of the of that study, they're running you know, 20,000 rotations a day on their wheel and their daily energy expenditure is the same as it was in baseline when they didn't have access to a wheel at all. Um, in humans, we see this when we get people uh, in exercise programs. And so, you know, we say, look, you're gonna be in this study and you're gonna exercise, you know, the equivalent of about 20 miles a week or even 30 miles a week of running. And we're gonna enforce that. We're gonna, we're gonna make sure you're in the, in the gym doing that work. We're gonna measure it and, and have you there and keep track. Um, and, those people, they start off burning more energy at first, but by month six, month 10, you know, a year out, their energy expenditures are about the same as they were when they started. Uh, and so it's, it's this adjustment that your body's doing that you're not even aware of that is the kind of a, an interesting observation and a kind of a, a um, yeah, I guess it's a discovery about how the body works that we weren't really appreciating before. And I think people still push back against Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it sort of reminds me of, of um, I've read Daniel Kahneman's work on, mm. on, you know, system one thinking and system two thinking. This is like yeah. system zero thinking. <laughs> the, the thinking that happens that has to override your brain because your brain would just mess it up. <laughs> conscious mind. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so so here's what people I think here's where people stumble on this as an as a as you know, the phenomenon of it, which you know, the, the, the data are very clear. This is something that happens sort of whether you believe it or not, these are what the data look like. So, um, so why do people have such a resistance to this idea? Well, a couple of things. First of all, I think they misunderstand it in some ways. They, people understand this to mean, and this is either because I didn't explain it well or because the media doesn't explain it well, but people take this to mean that you know, on a day that I work out and a day that I don't, that I burn the same number of calories those two days. And that's not the point here. Your body isn't making day-to-day -day adjustments or on the fly, minute-to-minute -minute adjustments, right? When you exercise, you do burn more calories. And if you have a big day, you're gonna burn more calories than you do on a really quiet resting day. So there will be these day-to-day -day fluctuations. We're not, that's not the argument. 
The argument is, is what those fluctuations sit on top of, the sort of resting baseline energy expenditure. And that's what seems to be kind of rising or lowering like, like the tides, right? And so when you get really, really active, your body goes, oh, we're really active. And so we're going to lower all that other stuff so that we still don't, you know, sort of, we, we keep the, the average, weekly average kind of the same as it was before we were really active. So, okay, so that's the other thing that people, I think, trip on is that there is so much of that background energy expenditure that you can easily make adjustments to that to sort of soak up and absorb this new active lifestyle that you have. Um, and people aren't aware of that, I think, because, and this is one of the reasons I wrote the book, actually, is that we're told that metabolism is all about exercise. And your body has 37 trillion cells that are all active all day. And most of your energy is burnt on stuff that things that you aren't even aware of, right? So that other piece that your activity is on is floating on top of is actually much bigger than the activity piece. And so adjustments there can easily absorb, you know, sort of uh, long-term changes in the activity part. Right. So help me understand my own experience. So in, yeah. in, in 2016, I started working on a book with a guy who had lost 230 pounds who had you know, adopted a whole food plant-based diet and become a, a competitive runner. Yeah. And so to work on the book, I'm like, well, I'm going to you know, partake. So yeah. I, I'm going to run a 50K. And so I went for training for 50K, which is basically 50 to 60 miles a week. Yeah. And I quickly lost 20 pounds and kept it off until I injured my leg like, like a year and a half ago. And mm. then the weight started creeping back up, even like... So how does that how does that experience fit, you know, sure. as, a, as an N of one into the yeah? Thing? I think there's a couple of things going on there. Uh, one is that it takes a while for your body to adjust. It does it doesn't adjust overnight, like I said. And so I would bet you that the weight that you lost from that really huge increase in in running. What were you running before you started doing the fifty to sixty miles a week? Like very little. Yeah. Okay. Would, so like, you went from 20 minutes and walk for half of it. Cause I was convinced sure. I, I was, should, you know? Okay. So you're, you're going from kind of zero, literally zero to 60 here, right? Yeah. Overnight. Well, a couple of things, first of all, it's going to take a couple months for your body to adjust. So I would, I would predict, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, this is like the 20 questions, but I would predict that, that almost all the weight you lost, you lost in the first two or three months. Yeah. Is that true or, or was it a continuous glide path? Yeah, no, no. By the time I ran that, uh, the 50, I, I started in May. By the time I ran the, the 50K in October, I, you know, I was, I was willing to take my shirt off for photos. And you were already at that flat line probably, right? You probably already basically yeah. plateaued. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And you kept that weight. So that's, so in the adjustment period, your body was burning more calories at first to, to the 60 miles a day. And you probably were a negative. I mean, you, you must have been a negative energy balance. That's the only way that weight loss happens. And so, uh, yeah. And then your body adjusted. And by October, your body was like, okay, this is what we do. We're this active, right? Uh -huh. um, and so, and then you, again, radically changed your lifestyle again and had to adjust to that. And in that meantime, your energy expenditure hadn't adjusted. And so now you're, now you're in positive energy balance and you gain weight back, right? So that's what I would see. I think that's probably the biggest piece of this is that you're, it takes bodies, bodies time to adjust. Mm -hmm. um, a couple other things going on there, which is uh, 60 miles a week might be at the point where we start to be, you start to threaten the body's ability to adjust. Actually, uh, we did a, an experiment where well, it was an experiment. We, we followed these people who ran from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. They ran a marathon a day, six days a week, sometimes seven days a week for five months from LA to DC. That was, that was and Ballinger, right? What's that? Robbie Ballinger. Uh, who was, I don't, that's not a name I know from this group. It was, um, it was Bryce Carlson was leading the science on it. And, um, okay. yeah, oh, yeah, and yeah. I'm, I'm blanking on the people who did the, uh, who led the thing. It's called the race across the USA. Um, and they do this on bikes, all the, on, on, on bicycles, I think yearly, but this was the first time or maybe the second time it ever been on, done on foot. Anyway, uh, the, um, those folks, you know, that that's, so a marathon is about 2,500 to 3000 calories just for the marathon. Right. 
And you add that on top of the 25 to 3000 calories you're already burning each day, just normally, uh, that's your body can't adjust to that. Your body, that, that's beyond, if you can run a marathon a day, that's beyond where your body can adjust. So now we're talking, we're, we're pushing beyond this constrained model where your body is able to absorb that much. Um, so that's 26 times six is, you know, 180 some miles. That, that, that's more than, that's more than you were doing at 60 miles a week, but even 60 miles a week might be threatening where you are able to adjust. Gotcha. Uh, so I think there's a couple pieces there. I think you were right at the limits of your body's ability to adjust. I think you were, um, saw all the weight loss early before your body had adjusted. And then on the flip side of that, saw the weight change again as your body was injured. Um, that's my prediction. One th question there would be, why did you get injured? Was it an overuse injury? Um, I think so. I think it's like a, I've always had sort of a wonky knee. That, yeah. uh, but the other, I mean, the other thing I'll say is after every, after every race of marathon or greater distance, I get sick a week later. And yeah. I think I'm beginning to understand that now after reading the book when I've, you know, about energy yeah. and where, where the energy gets taken from. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. The other thing is that if you push yourself 60 miles a week for however many months that was, you know, one thing I talk about in the book is you can you can go be above this ceiling. We can think about this, um, your body's sort of innate desire to keep energy expenditures within a pretty narrow range. I call it constrained energy expenditure, but whatever you want to call it, we can think about it as kind of a, a fixed budget that your body runs under uh, for, for your whole life. Now you can go, you can deficit spend, right? You can go above that ceiling. You can go above that fixed budget for a while. And so people who run a hundred mile Western States ultra marathon or a Kona Ironman or um, uh, the Tour de France, which is happening soon. Is it happening right now? It's happening, it's happening right now. I don't know what stage we're in. Um, you know, those athletes are definitely above whatever that fixed budget is, fixed energy budget is, but they just like any other fixed budget situation, they can't do it forever. They can't deficit spend forever. They're gonna come back down. Um, and where you hit, where it like, when the bill become, when the bill comes due, how quickly that happens depends on how high above your fixed budget you are. And so it might've been that you were doing fairly well above your, like at or near your fixed budget for a while and it felt fine. And you didn't know the bills come and do in whatever it was, 10 months, 12 months, but it did. And that's when your body was like, yeah, we can't repair anymore. We're, we're, we know, we're done. <laughs> and yeah, it didn't make any sense in the sort of old machine model that, yeah. I, that I was operating under in which, oh, well, I'm just going to burn fat because I was never, you know, I got lean, but I never got cut. I never got like 8%, 6%, yeah. you know, Instagram. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Uh, and I, my, you know, I'll just keep burning fat, but, if, but like, I love your evolutionary model of that the hypothalamus is the business manager. That's that, right. That you have to, that if you're exercising a lot, then it takes energy away from other systems. Yeah, that's right. So we, you know, again, you got your energy on exercise that's kind of fluctuating on top of this other stuff. Well, what's the other stuff? It's in its immune system, it's your production system, it's, um, you know, stress reactivity, it's your nervous system, which has to keep its ion balances right to keep your nerves firing. Um, all this stuff costs a lot of energy. And some of it's not all of it, but some of it's, you know, kind of optional. So inflammation, for example, this, this quick inflammation response or this really high stress reactivity response is optional. You don't have to do that. And your body can begin to cut away at those things. Um, when you exercise, which is one of the reasons exercise is so good for you, which I want to stress, we're not saying don't exercise, um, but exercise because of the way it kind of helps you regulate your energy budget. That's actually one of the reasons to do it. Now, if you're spending too much energy on exercise and you don't have enough energy for repair and, you know, and immune function and all that stuff. Yeah. Now you're in trouble. So that's the other side. That's, that's the kind of the, uh, the, right. The dark side of these trade-offs is if you push it too far, you get into overtraining syndrome, that kind of stuff. So the, the big question I had after reading the book mm -hmm. um, was, so ba basically to paraphrase my understanding of it, we have a sort of a fixed energy budget, which mm -hmm. every species sort of has one based on its evolutionary history. And we have one that serves a really good evolutionary pur purpose. When we exercise, when we move, when we are active, we, we then shift the caloric spend from these other things 
to exercise, which is why exercise is so good for us, because then we're not, we don't have a hyperactive immune system. Um, we don't have a hyperactive inflammatory system. We don't have a hyperactive stress system. So my question is, why, when we don't exercise, do our bodies spend all this energy on dumb shit? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the, those are really hard questions. Those, those kind of why questions are tough to answer. Um, I don't know, but here's a way to think about it. Your body is not as smart as we think it is, right? Your body has, you sort of evolve these physiological rules, if this, then that kind of thing. It's like a computer program on that, it's that level of smart, right? Mm -hmm. There's no actual thinking thing, wondering about what's best for you into your future, right? There's this sort of if then kind of things going on in the background. And, um, and the if then on how you spend energy on a immune system could be, look, if energy is really, if you're in energy, uh, positive energy balance, if things are really good for you, then spend the extra energy on, on immune system and spend it on, on stress response because this isn't gonna last forever, right? Evolutionarily, those would have been really rare times that you would have been flush with energy Usually you're working your butt off and, and food's hard to get. So, you know, in the, in the food good times, you spend that energy when you can, but you know that that's going to be the first expense to go when things get back to normal. But we never get back to normal in this weird world that we live in. And that's the problem. Okay. Because I did, I did have a theory. It, it, it veers into evolutionary psychology, mm. which I'm, I'm hoping you don't hold much stock in. <laughs> Not uh, usually. Depends on. No. Yeah. So, so I'm way over my skis here. But it occurred to me, like, if if we are like, there's a difference between being in positive energy balance because I just got a kill, or yeah. it's it's avocado season. I found the the orchard. Sure. Versus, and you point this out in the research, being sedentary, like completely mm. sedentary, like almost all of us. And my, my thought was maybe the brain goes, oh, I'm completely sedentary. That must mean I'm injured, I'm sick. And therefore oh. those evolutionary responses would make sense. Is there any, like <laughs> any- Yeah, I don't know. So well, an interesting piece about that is that uh, the kind of behavior that we all are familiar with from having the flu, which is you just want to curl up and sleep, you know? Um, the, that behavior is kind of understudied and it does seem to be kind of an evolved response. You, you, you get away from people, you stop eating and you just kind of wait it out at the illness. Um, could that on the flip side be how your body's responding to the sedentary behavior? I don't know, I'm skeptical, but you know, uh, the science is not short on interesting hypotheses. We're, we're short on good solid tests. So uh -huh. I look forward to your test of it. It's a good, it's an yeah. interesting idea. <laughs> no, I was just going to throw it to you. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I bef before, you know, be before you have, um, before you embrace the cool explanation, which is what we all want to do, of course, you have to test all the boring ones and show that they don't work. Right. So I don't know. That's what I love about the book so much that it's so like when people are like arguing, because everybody argues about metabolism and exercise and yeah. nutrition and diet and health and and it's so tempting to create these stories. Yeah. Everybody's stories are good. Like I, <laughs> like I remember reading yeah. Wheat Belly and thinking, wow, that makes so much sense. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then, you know, it's like, well, how can everybody be right? Well, every, everyone's got a different um, baseline metaphor. And, you know, so when, like, when Gary Taubes, who's one of the best, you know, storytellers. Oh, right? yeah. Uh huh. When he puts it to the test, the data don't line up. Yeah, that's right. And then you know, and then he goes on uh, interesting, you know, uh, explanatory tours, apology tours for the model, right? And you know, well, the data don't fit because they didn't do the study quite right, or they didn't, you know, uh, it's, it wasn't long enough, or you know, whatever. And um, at some point, this is what separates people who are doing the science from people like Gary. Uh, and, you know, I think I want to start off by saying, I think Gary has, you know, has good intentions with this, wants to get people healthy and that's great. And people do have good outcomes on low carb diets often, not for the reasons Gary argues, I don't think, but, um, but when you start walking away from the data and saying, well, I don't care what your study says, I don't believe it. I don't believe not just one data point, but I don't believe 
this whole constellation of studies that don't support the model. I think all the studies are wrong and I like my idea. No, sorry, that's not science anymore. That's just belief. Are you seeing any, um, any evidence or any, any labs doing work that are trying to disprove your theories? Like, is there, is there any, is there still sort of sure. room for sort of interesting debate or is it at this point, is it just sort of cults? No, uh, no, I mean, I think, you know, I think there's a couple of things that, that we haven't figured out yet. I mean, this is a new idea, relatively speaking, and it's going to take a long time to kind of, you know, have it, uh, some, what has to happen in science is you have a new idea. Um, people don't believe it at first, and that's fine. And then you get enough observations of the same thing. And you say, look, this is a real thing that we have to take seriously. And I think we're, this is where we're at right now. Now let's figure out why it's happening and figure out all the sort of the parameters on this thing. And I think we're at that stage now. Um, and there are people who are going to say, look, you know, we had these people exercising for a few months and their energy expenditures did go up. Okay, well, that's interesting. What was it about that group that, that didn't fit the overall scheme of what we see? Um, we don't know those details yet. What makes people more or less likely to sort of compensate faster or slower or more or less? Um, exactly what is it that's happening internally at the cellular level with this compensation? You know, we're talking, we're talking kind of casually about your immune system getting turned down or stress reactivity getting turned down, but that's, those are whole cellular pathways that have to, you know, there are predictions to be made there about what happens and, and that you have to show that. You can't just, you know, the evidence is there in terms of, you know, the epidemiological evidence, but where can we actually pin down the, the pathways? So yeah, I, people are pushing back in a good way. It's been really fun to have those debates. Um, people are skeptical and they should be, they should be skeptical of everything, you know? Um, but I think we're, we're kind of pinning down exactly the, the sort of shape of this thing and, and how wide, you know, how, if, if the budget is fixed, how fixed is it? And exactly how is it that you meet that fixed budget? Those are the next set of questions. Mm -hmm. gotcha. um, so one of the things that I loved was sort of the evolutionary explanation of like this, this hominin uh, experiment and then how we diverged from the great apes. And so you talk about like you're three, you're 300 in dog years and, <laughs> and the humans yeah. are like, we are the outliers. It's not the dogs, right? That's everybody, right. Everybody, everybody else ages quickly, except for like us and sea turtles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, us and sea turtles, uh, other primates are pretty slow. That's right. Um, so there's these two, two big things that happened evolutionarily that, that have sort of parked us where we are in the world of, of you know, in, in the tree of life right now. Um, one is that around, you know, 50 or 60 million years ago, when primates got their start, so primates are this group of mammals that we, we belong to, so apes and humans and monkeys and lorises and lemurs, um, something must have happened there that changed their metabolic physiology re really kind of significantly, because if, when we measure all primates today, including us, all primates are burning half the energy that you'd expect for a mammal of that body size. Okay, so if we look, um, humans, you know, let's say you have a 150 pound person, average energy expenditure for a 150 pound person might be, you know, 2,500 calories a day, something like that. Um, we go to 100 pound antelope, or carnivore or anything like that in the wild, and they're burning 5,000 calories a day, right? Twice as much as us. So, and then, then not just humans, all, all primates are shifted low. And that's, we think, why we grow so slowly, right? Um, I've got a 15 year old dog, love that dog, but you know, I, I hope she lives forever, but realistically, you know, she's at the end of her life, probably 15 years old. That's all really old for a dog. Um, and, you know, here I am in my forties and I hope I'm, you know, I'm only mid middle-aged, you know? Uh, and so we live really slowly. All the animals are fast. And I, we think it's that slow, slow life is because of our slow metabolisms, we think. And then within the apes, we have a, you know, compared to other chimpanzees, you know, compared to chimpanzees and gorillas and orangutans, humans have faster metabolisms. We think that that helps us pay for things like big brains and so there's a sort of a secondary shift that happens in our lineage in our little branch of the primate bow. Um, but yeah, I, I love those evolutionary pieces.
Yeah, because it, it, I mean, when you think about it, when you think about our, my body in terms of how it betrays me in the modern world and how it makes no sense, it's very disempowering. But when you, yeah. when you put it in your, pers your perspective of, of like, it's trying to keep within this energy budget, it's trying mm -hmm. to mitigate risk, like yeah. almost everything you talk about, every evolutionary strategy to some extent is either an overextension for, for opportunism or yeah. a, 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 a response to mitigate the risk. Like I love how you talked about like what human, what made humans humans is the and in hunting, <laughs> hunting and gathering. It's the fact that we have to share. Yeah, yeah, isn't that is, I love that too. Um, just the observation that that's, that's so key. Um, yeah, so that that's fun. That that's the little you know. Why do humans have faster metabolisms than chimpanzees and gorillas? Well, it's because we have this really weird way of make, of getting our food, which is that we we all kind of each go off our different ways and get different kinds of food, and then we come back and share it. And so, you know, that's hunting and gathering, right? Half of us are going to go hunt today, and half of us are going to go gather. And if the hunters come back with a zebra, that's awesome for everybody. Um, if they come home empty handed, that's okay because all the gatherers will have brought home the sure thing, the, the plant foods. And it's only that balanced portfolio, high risk, high reward versus the sure thing. And you combine that and that's unbeatable. And that's why there's 8 billion of us and we're talking via satellite and you know that we run the world right now and potentially run it off a cliff, but that's a different story. But this is why we're so successful is because of that and that sharing. Um, and yeah, that's, that was, uh, I think that's a really important piece to take home is just how connected we all are. You know, the divisions we make amongst ourselves and the tribalism and the blue versus red or the whatever it was. If I was growing up, it was the Soviets versus the US, right? I mean, we always wanna have this in versus that group, but actually it's the, you know, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the sharing and it's, it's the community that makes us so strong. And if we can kind of understand that, that's a really powerful way to live our lives. Right. Of course, we, we grew up on the opposite sides of the track because I was a Rutgers fan. Oh, <laughs> well, you know, we can still be friends, though. That's all right. Yeah, I grew up at, at Penn State. Um, it was Penn State versus the world every every Saturday, you know, in college football season. Right. Um, yeah. And so, so what you're saying is like we, we figured out how to eat our cake and have it, too. We have these long lifespans and pretty high metabolisms. And, and High metabolisms for, for a primate. Yeah. I mean, we're still low compared to everybody else, but we're like, you know, the, uh, uh, yeah, we're, we're the, we're the little bump <laughs> off of the norm for, for primates. Yeah. Right. And you make the point that that's probably how our propensity for fat gathering, fat storage, mm. fat, that if, if we're going to be spending fast, we need a way to collect when times are good. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. And uh, we're, it's, it's absolutely true, for sure, that we are the fattest ape. You know, you go to the zoo and you see these pot-bellied gorillas and pot-bellied chimps, and, and they look maybe like they're fat, but actually that's because they have big intestines because they eat so many leaves and so many, you know, they don't have any energy density in their diet like we have in ours because we cook our food. So our, our diets are super energy dense. Um, and we eat meat, which is also more energy dense, but the, the and, you know, fats and all that kind of stuff. But the point is they aren't really fat actually. They're actually leaner than you and me. So uh, a chimp in a zoo has 10% body fat, which is like Olympic level, you know, athlete. Um, and we, so we have fast metabolisms and we're also the fattest. So right there, you're like, wait a second, then my usual model of how energy expenditure and fat go together is wrong. Uh, Cause how can you be, be both things? But, but that's absolutely right, we are. So I had a question about that because you know, our cats and dogs could go become obese. Mm. And I'm wondering if we, you know, I mean, no IRB would let you do this study to feed, yeah. you know, apes and zoos the way we feed ourselves. Like, but, no, you can actually, so you're right that no IRB would do it, um, but it's been done. And so if you go, uh, there are famous cases in this, you know, in, in the ape sanctuary and zoo world of really obese apes. And uh, it doesn't happen very often, but inevitably when it happens, it's because they're being fed, you know, human foods, the, the vast diversity of, of foods, you know, oh. the, the, they, they get, you know, there's all these, it's interesting stories, but they're all kind of, you know, case studies, but you get these uh, 
these apes that kind of you know, get really friendly with their handlers and their handlers just, they love them and they want to do nice things for them. And so they do what they would do for their, <laughs> for their human friends. And they bring them, you know, cake and they bring them, uh, you know, whatever, whatever they love, uh, high energy human foods. And they just, bah, they can't, they can't resist. And they get fat the same way we get fat. Hmm. Hmm. So, um, one, one more sort of a uh, specific question from the person who actually uh, turned me on to your work, who told me to listen to your uh, amazing conversation yeah. with Robin Chatterjee. Um, so like, do we, so the problem with losing weight is if we exercise to lose weight, we're, we're going to reduce other caloric expenditure and we're also going to start, you know, eating more because yeah. if, you, if you're more active, you eat more. And if we try to diet, you know, which, you know, you call like this, this, um, you know, metabolic restriction, yeah. then our, you know, then we, the, the hypothalamus tones down the, the thyroid gland and it sends our brain into paroxysms of, of ecstasy every time to see a calorie, <laughs> right? So it's like, we're fucked. So yeah. is, is, is there, has there been research on what is the caloric deficit that can lead to sustained mm. weight loss that doesn't trick the, you know, doesn't trigger the body into going to emergency mode. Yeah, I don't, there needs to be more. There's not a ton of work on sort of what that tipping point is, um, at least not that I'm aware of, but the, here are, you know, it's, it's hard to track calories anyhow. So here's, if you're going to kind of take this home and try to use this, this is what you should be using um, as your guide. You should be eating a diet that fills you up. So you don't feel like you're starving. If you feel like you're starving, probably those mechanisms are kicking in. Mm -hmm. So you need to try to find foods that fill you up on less. So, um, and we know from satiety experiments that foods that are high in protein, foods that are high in fiber uh, can both work. And so, and actually, by the way, the protein piece is probably why low carb diets work so well for people because protein is very satisfying and, and, and fills you up. Um, the fiber piece is probably why whole food plant-based diets often work really well for people because the fiber fills you up. So there isn't like, you know, anyway, the, the, these diet wars about who's, who's right, I think is actually, they're all playing around on the same system. But um, if, you, if you feel like you're starving and you feel miserable, um, that's probably a good indication that your body has engaged those energy sparing mechanisms. And also it means you're probably not going to stick with your diet. Uh, but, you know, losing weight is hard. Uh, we know this from study after study and personal experience after personal experience. And so two things with that. One, I think we need to be honest about why it's so hard. And it's because it's a brain regulation thing, right? It's not willpower. It's not uh, magical ingredients. It's um, the fact that we live in an environment that the foods are ultra processed and they overwhelm our ability to make our brains over ability to regulate intake and, and we overeat and, you know, and then losing the weight gets really hard. The other thing is, um, because it's so hard to change your weight when you're an adult, I think we really need to focus us particularly on childhood obesity issues. Um, because these are so hard to fix when you're an adult, you can do it and you should, you, and you should do it if you need to get to a healthy weight. But, um, but man, it would be a whole lot easier for society and for everyone if, if we didn't get there in the first place. Yeah. When I, when I was, like what I really took away from your book, and I think a lot of my work um, has been needs to shift from you know from a like sort of individual character, like yeah, yeah for an individual, yeah, that's all you got. But really, this is this is a public health issue. It's almost like you know telling people in you know seventeenth century, eighteenth century London not not to drink water from the Thames. It's like you know it's not like you have a choice. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And I, you know, I think, um, so I think the, the willpower thing is, uh, isn't helpful and I don't think it's right. I don't think it's a willpower issue, um, with obesity. Uh, I think people are surrounded by a food environment that's really hard to regulate your intake with, you know? Um, and here's what I would say. The one thing you can do maybe that's helpful is don't put it in your house, right? If you know, there are foods that you are going to overconsume. Um, if you know, you know, if your if your refrigerator and cupboards are full of ultra processed foods, which we know lead people to overconsume, then maybe it's time to, to have a look at that and see if you can replace that with foods that 
that are less dangerous for you, at least in your immediate environment, because that's all you can really control. You can't control the supermarket. You probably can't control what's in the break room at work, but you can control your home at least. And that's a place to start. Right. And, and since reading the book, I've gone on a bland diet as an experiment because hmm. um, I'm, you know, I, you say like, I have no idea how many calories I take in. Yeah, it's really I hard to track, actually. That, yeah. Uh, let me get quoted exactly that uh, diet surveys are just random number generators. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's and, pretty much true. Yep. And so I found that like, even though like, okay, so I'm having, you know, tofu and tempeh and vegetables and whole grains, I'm still salting them. I'm still using sauces like sriracha that have sugar in them. Mm. I, just, I went no salt, no sugar. Oh, wow. And food's kind of you know, honestly pretty bland. Like even like I'm doing like, you know, Mrs. Dash with like lemon oil and mm -hmm. nutritional yeast and, and garlic powder and stuff like and, gin, and fresh ginger. It's still bland. <laughs> and yeah. I'm, I'm, I can tell I'm like, I'm not eating for kicks. Yeah, that's interesting. And how, and have you seen a, the number on the bathroom scale change? Yeah, about uh, seven pounds in a week and a half. Oh my gosh. Wow. And do you feel less full than you did before? Or is it the same kind of satiety, but you're just eating less to get there? I feel as I feel as satisfied, but I don't feel as full. Oh, that's interesting. Like, yeah. like I don't like I can like one of the meals I'm having is potatoes, like a boil a bunch of potatoes, put them in the fridge next day, eat a potato. I was I was putting uh, mustard on them. And then I realized the mustard has salt. So now I'm not even doing that. Wow. Yeah. And then, like after three, I'm like, well, oh, that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> if I had sort of air fried them with, um, you know, some sort of like crispy French fried uh, spice. Oh, this is so good. Like I would eat. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to keep to that. So that's interesting. Um, and you're having good success with it. That's wonderful. I think the trick is, you know, uh, you know, can, can you do it for long term? I don't know. You'll, you'll tell us. Yeah. Well, I mean, I already shifted from sort of processed, like I don't have processed food. So I think there, oh, that's there great. is an intellectual shift you can make to say, yeah. you know, these things are, no, are not food in the same way the Hadza will not eat snakes. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And I mean, that's why these really dramatic, I mean, that's why the low carb diets work. You basically take half the menu and say, nope, I can't eat that. Well, you know, like you say, food is actually kind of bland um, unless you put all these kind of exotic spices on it. So even if you are just going to eat steak, well, how much steak can you eat before you're done? You're not, you know, right. it's like eating potatoes or eating anything. I mean, if you don't have the big, crazy mix and match of, of the modern diet, especially with the processing, but even, you know, that, then you're, you're not going to eat as much. You just won't. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the couple of minutes we have left, if, if you were um sort of dictator and you can yeah. like change laws yeah um, since since you know individual behavior is so hard to deal with what yeah what, what would you what do you recommend you're part of the you know the duke global health initiative what do you recommend as policy to mm. help humanity you know not get sick and die of metabolic disease and not kill ourselves through climate disaster okay uh I'll do the climate one second. Let's do the let's do the obesity thing first. Uh, I think that there are a lot of places where we uh, have direct impact as a society on what children eat. And like I said, I think childhood issues are the most important ones because they those are ones that set people up for a lifetime of health or a lifetime of disease. Um, and so there are plenty of places where we feed our the nation's children in a school class, in a, in a school lunchroom or, you know, daycare or whatever. And I think there ought to be really tight rules and, and, and money, you know, money to support putting good food on those kids' plates, right? Uh, school cafeteria lunches are all over the, you know, all over the place in terms of quality. And as you might expect, poor school districts have poor food, you know, often. And, 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 and even the wealthy ones don't make it a priority all the time. And so I think that we need to, to focus on that. What, we, what are the kids eating? There needs to be more regulation on that and, and money to support it. Not just rules to say, don't do this or do it this way, but actually put our, our money is where our mouths are, or our kids' mouths are and, and feed them well. Um, the second thing would be, I think that we need to price in to the foods that are in the supermarket. We need to price in the societal cost. 
you know, and if that's taxes on sugary beverages, that kind of thing, or taxes on processed foods, um, because right now, if you walk into a supermarket, the cheapest food is the stuff that's the worst for you, right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be that way. Um, the, we put billions of dollars of subsidies into all sorts of different priority, uh, you know, priorities in, our, yeah, in this country. We are putting billions of dollars of subsidy, or at least hundreds of millions into high fructose corn syrup. Yes, and yeah, exactly. All that stuff, right? I mean, um, and so we are already, you know, people, because the pushback is, well, it's a free market and we should let it be a free market. And that's what's, well, it isn't actually, because we, we like you say, we put money into high fructose corn syrup, we put money into uh, fossil fuels development. Um, and so there are all these monies going in that, that, that make our diet environment as perverse as it is. So we need to, to reprice that. And I don't, I'm not an economist. I don't know how you do it, but you have to do that. And then I think the next piece is now you have to also price in the long-term costs of using fossil fuels versus green. And then you get people pushing toward um, getting away from fossil fuels because that has to happen too. I think we, if we, any climate change solution has to keep the top line number of energy burned globally more or less the same, or we're going to have a really huge societal crisis on our hands because, you know, I live too far from work to drive every, to, to walk every day. I live nine miles from work, which isn't actually that far, you know, but it is it's too far for me to walk um, or even ride my bike every day. Um, the, if, how far are you from the supermarket? How far are you from, so it, our society is, it's not just transportation either, but our society is based on all this extra energy and it will be a radical change um, in unhappy ways, a lot of them, to, to take the energy out. So we have to keep the energy there, but it has to be green. So that's the other thing you have to price in is how do you make those incentives happen? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, for, for a lot of the book, I was kind of romanticizing the Hadza mm. until you mentioned that four out of 10 of their children die of infections. Yeah. In child, like, I, like, oh, no, no, I don't want that. I want my... Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't want to have parasite infections and, and fear of death, you know, and like- Absolutely, I, you know, and I mean, get back to that, uh, you know, you asked me how I got into this business and I went through high school not being sure what I would do with my adult life and even into college. And then, and then when I chose, I got to choose something as, I got to choose what was fulfilling for me and um, something I was really passionate about. And if you're a Hadza kid growing up, you can be a hunter or a gatherer, right? Those are the two job options. Um, and that's fine. Those kids are happy and the adults are happy and maybe that's fine. Uh, but it would be a very different society. We would have right now about, you know, one person in the food production industry makes enough to feed 35 others, which means those 35 other people get to have a career that's not on the farm. Um, and I don't know if societally we'd want to trade that actually. What do you want your kids? You know, we want, we want farmers and that's wonderful and great, but we also want doctors and artists and teachers. And, you know, we want all these, all these different parts of our society. And we kind of lose that a little bit if we really went back to, to, to the traditional way. Right. Although and I guess this is above both of our skis around the idea of being part of a tribe and knowing you're contributing to it. Like, True. I, think, yeah, I think there's a crisis of meaning. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's right. I think that's fair. Yeah, that's a good point. How do you balance all that stuff? That's right. So what's your what's your next research agenda? I saw your uh, on Twitter, you're um, recruiting a study on um, women in pregnancy and exercise. What, what's the yeah, next? yeah, we're kind of, you know, so the um, the idea that your energy, your body is sort of keeping energy expenditures constrained and keeping um, keeping a fixed budget has all sorts of health implications. Um, for pregnancy, for example, so how do how does a mother in during pregnancy, where you know there's so much energy demand for the the you know for the pregnancy itself, how does she balance that against exercise if she wants to exercise through the pregnancy? Um, and of course, in traditional societies, that's not an option. You have to be physically active, perhaps through pregnancy for to farm or whatever. But in even today, women who want to exercise through pregnancy, how do you, how do they balance that? How does that work? So that's um, one exciting place we're going next is how do that, does that actually shake out? Um, but that's, that's kind of the idea. We're going to keep on pushing and, and seeing where all of this fixed energy budget view of life takes us. That's a big one. And we'll be going to other populations around the globe as well and more lab stuff. And that's the idea. 
Awesome. I'm going to let you go. It's top of the hour. Quickly, uh, how can people find you and follow you? Oh, uh, I'm most active on Twitter of all the social medias at Herman Ponser. You can find us here online at Duke. Um, and of course, I hope you'll check out the book, which you can get anywhere. It's called Burn, and it's anywhere you buy books, uh, local, independent place, or Amazon. And it's awesome. So you also burn calories. If laughter burns calories, you'll burn calories reading this book because it's hilarious as well. <laughs> thank so, you for saying uh, that. Thank you so much for taking the time for this amazing work and for being you. <laughs> it was really fun to have the conversation. Thanks a lot. All right. Take care. Be well.